I'm Betsy Kim, Editorial Director of Lawyers.com, and I'm joined by Jessica Mason Piclo, a professor who teaches constitutional law and public policy at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She has also served as that law school's Assistant Director of the Health Law Institute, and she's the co-author of this book, Crow After Row. Jessica, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I read your book and found it very informative and quite fascinating, and I read a review of it posted on blogs.lawyers.com, but can you explain to us why you wrote this book and why now? I wrote the book um, Crow After Row with Robin Marty um, in part because since 2010 we've witnessed an unprecedented flood of anti-abortion restrictions at the state level. And they are coming on um, right at the time of the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. So it was a really um, important pinpoint moment for us historically and I think culturally. We have a significant Supreme Court decision that, grantly, that greatly expanded civil rights and, and women's rights. Um, and we have the anniversary of that coming at a time with a significant political pushback. Um, and so Robin and I wanted to take a look at both the forces that brought that together and what are the very real challenges to this decision. Yeah, and I recently read in the Huffington Post, you reminded me when you brought up the 2010 elections, that since that time, more than 50 reproductive rights centers for women have closed in uh, 27 states. Subsequent to your book's publication, can you give us an update on what you find of some of the most alarming developments? Absolutely. One of the greatest challenges about writing the book was that in some ways we were writing it real time as this legislation was going on. And then when we were in the edit phase, of course, there's another legislative cycle. And just when you think it can't get any worse, it, sh it certainly does. We're seeing a rash of new um, what we call trap laws. So those are targeted regulations for abortion providers and they are laws that are designed to close clinics so they are not restrictions on um, a person's right to choose specifically the same way that say a mandatory ultrasound is um, but what they do is force clinics to in some cases comply with the same architectural requirements as standalone surgical clinics even though they don't perform those types of, pr of procedures um, some other trap provisions require doctors to have admitting privileges at area hospitals um, before they can practice and if they don't then they face steep fines and sometimes jail time so what we're seeing is is, is a shift in strategy um, that is designed to close and target clinics one by one particularly in states where we already have a clinic shortage places like arkansas alabama north dakota states with one um, maybe two providers left of these laws, including the trap ones that you've just mentioned, which one do you find the most violative of women's rights? You know, forcing women to watch ultrasounds, cutting off funding to create insurmountable burdens. Which one do you find the most challenging? It's really hard to place them in a hierarchy because um, particularly when you lay out all the restrictions cumulatively, the effect is just dire. Um, I think that those provisions that are advanced most recently in the name of quote unquote women's safety are particularly offensive because they um, there is nothing advancing women's safety when we make access to reproductive health care harder, more difficult, more expensive, more burdensome. Um, that is not, there is nothing about about women's safety in, in that. Um, and so that to me personally is offensive because I feel like um, that is a very cynical approach to a political end. Um, and then any of the restrictions that assume that uh, terminating a pregnancy isn't a well thought out and difficult decision for a person to make, I also take issue with. And a lot of the informed consent provisions fall in this uh, uh, realm. Um, mandatory transvaginal ultrasounds, um, additional waiting periods. Um, there are model bills being proposed that we may see in the next legislative session or two that's a return to spousal consent. You listed several states for some with some of these new developments, as well as um, pointing out the laws uh, mm -hmm. in the book that are particular to several states where I guess it's the toughest for women. Why should people in states like New York and California, where abortions will most likely always be readily available, care about what's going on in these other states? Well, I think first and foremost, when we remember that reproductive, that the issue of reproductive rights is one that is a matter of fundamental rights. 
right? Fundamental human rights. Somebody in, in New York or California doesn't necessarily have a fundamental right to have more access to reproductive health care than a woman living in Mississippi, for example. So that your ability to access health care should not be dependent on the state you live. This is a very fundamental constitutional concept embraced by the 14th Amendment and our equal protection laws. People on both sides of the debate have acknowledged that um, support for women's reproductive rights tends to drop with later term abortions. How do you respond to that sentiment? Well, I, you know, Pew, I think it was Pew who recently had a survey out that um, said that actually when you talk to people about the circumstances that that often prompt a later term abortion, um, people will still support that decision, that there is a lot of a lot that gets lost in the political rhetoric around this. Is there ever a time when you feel the right of a fetus would um, outweigh that of the woman carrying the fetus? I don't think I can because I mean I don't I can't think of a single other context where we restrict the rights of one population in order to expand the rights of another. And so if we really look at abortion as one um, piece of a comprehensive reproductive health and, and rights framework, then you know the, I would ask the question of is there ever a time when we say okay, well it's acceptable to impinge on the voting rights of a particular group, for example, because there's this other issue or these other set of rights at stake. And um, we don't do that in, in, in um, personal situations anywhere else in the law. Um, the government will make some balance of rights in speech context, for example, right? So we don't have big public, public brawl or that you know, some people have zones of privacy even within public spaces. So we do balance rights, but we don't restrict rights in the name of advancing the rights of somebody else's. Every time our country has had great expansions in civil rights, nobody else lost the right unless you consider losing the right to buy and sell people in the slave trade something that was inherent, and I personally don't. So you know, I, I mean, I think that. I guess the answer, you know, a short answer is no, but I gave you the long explanation in terms of the framework of that. Or is there another way of looking at it? Because I guess looking at affirmative action, for example, mm -hmm. maybe some people would say the rights of some group are impinged, you know, with the reverse discrimination type claims, but then other people respond, but for the whole good of society and for other larger principles at stake, you know, sorry, sometimes that, that just has to happen. Yeah, you know, I mean, I wouldn't buy in, I, I don't, I mean, I push back against that too, because then I say, well, if we're going to, you know, when we look at affirmative action policies, then we also look at, at um, you know, um, legacy admissions and all sorts of ways that we have structural institutions that um, keep certain people from having less access to our, you know, full civic engagement and really sort of full autonomy under the law. The ability to enter in and out of the marketplace, for example, is not something that men have restrictions on based on their reproductive rights, um, but that um, the impact of taking choice away from women really does change the way that they can provide for themselves, provide for their families, um, and you know, be full participants in our society. People who support restrictions or would support something like a Medicaid restriction because they, you know, don't want their tax dollars supporting abortion. Um, if you ask them about the circumstances in which their own life um, or, you know, that where they would choose abortion for themselves, economic reasons are, are part of that. So I think that, um, unfortunately, the fight over abortion access is part of the larger um, battle and, and um, war on the poor that this country has been waging since the 80s. Um, and I don't see that that um, getting any better, unfortunately, anytime soon. Well, thank you, Jessica Mason Peeklo, for joining us today. You've provided a lot of insight on this often very emotional and divisive issue. So thank, thank you for your you. time and your help. My pleasure. I'll be happy to come back anytime.